This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. There are so many hurdles in our Universe keeping intelligence from arising. Once it has, it seems inevitable that intelligence should pursue technology, but perhaps it isn't. So today we return to our Fermi Paradox Great Filter series for a fourth installment of what had been intended just to be a trilogy, focusing first on what factors of our Universe and Galaxy might make life rare, then what might make life sustaining worlds like Earth rare, and finally on what might make the evolution of intelligence rare. In Rare Intelligence we did look briefly at what might make the rise of technology, once you had intelligence, less inevitable than we might think but mostly concluded that once you had a value for technology, it might not be inevitable that you go down that path, but most would, so it would probably be a minor filter at most. Since that episode came out, a little over two years ago, I've been thinking on the matter more and I'm no longer as confident on that assertion, and we're going to dig into that today and focus more on some psychological and sociological phenomena that might present hurdles. Since it has been over two years, a brief refresher is appropriate, and you might want to check out the original trilogy if you haven't seen it recently, or ever. Combine all that with our tendency to do long episodes, especially when discussing the Fermi Paradox, and you probably want to grab a drink and a snack before proceeding. We often abridge what the Fermi Paradox is when discussing it, since we discuss it so often and want to save time, and because its exact meaning is a bit variable. Fundamentally, it's expressing the apparent paradox between the vast age and size of our Universe and why that Universe doesn't seem to be swarming with civilizations, especially in modern times where we can see just how common stars like our own are and how many seem to have an abundance of planets in orbit around them. Many solutions for explaining it have been offered, but the focus of this series is just that there is no paradox because we're simply massively overestimating how likely life is to arise, grow to complexity and diversity, get smart, get technology, then grow to be a galaxy spanning civilization we could easily spot. Looking for massive civilizations is a critical notion with the Fermi Paradox too. We couldn't see a clone of ourselves even 200 light years away unless we were staring right at it, and of course if it were on the same timeline as us, we'd not see anything anyway because their first radio signals would still not have reached us. Timelines of mere thousands of years mean very little against the age of the Universe, but it's not the whole Universe that counts for the Fermi Paradox, since our Universe is fairly young and it would seem unlikely anyone could have a head start on us by several billion years, so it's only our relative neighborhood we can even meaningfully discuss. The farther out we look, the more Universe we see, but the younger and more primordial the worlds we see. Eukaryotic cells, those with a nucleus to them and what many of us feel was a fairly important hurdle or filter on the evolution of life, didn't arise on Earth until about 1.8 billion years ago by current best estimates. If we assume that no galaxy spanning civilizations could have arisen before that, then there's no chance of finding any further out than 1. billion years because the light from them couldn't have reached us yet. There are about a quintillion stars in that volume, a billion billion. That's a big number on which civilizations could have arisen from and spread out to the stars, but none seem to have. Now there could be a single specific reason, but we usually assume that there are several minor and not so minor hurdles along the path. We categorize these as lesser, minor, major, and great filters, where lesser ones are merely more likely than not to stop advancement minor filters are uncommon to pass but not rare, and major filters are the kind that less than a percent succeed in passing. On the far side, a great filter is what we normally consider lottery odds, million and one or less, and many are suggested for these and we often group related filters into an overall great filter too. One of these on its own might reduce the odds to one in a quintillion all by itself, and of course we have some of these we can speak to with great certainty already, beginning with that one in a quintillion probability, 
that's how many stars there are we might hope to see something emerge from, but it's really only how many planets we might expect at most that could realistically hold life. We just take for granted it needs to occur on a planet, and Earth-like worlds and large moons around gas giants is where all that action takes place. That is already a huge filter, because virtually none of the mass in our solar system is in the planets. Rocky planets probably make up less than a millionth of the mass of our universe. Moreover, only the thin crust of those worlds would be hospitable for life, generally speaking. So we've already cut the amount of matter that might be involved in biology down to around a billionth of the available matter before we even get out the gate just by focusing on planets. We've discussed how valid that assumption is in other episodes like Panspermia or Void Ecology, but it's an assumption that's so taken for granted that we usually don't even think about it when discussing the Fermi Paradox. I like pointing it out though because the Fermi Paradox is so often phrased in the context of Drake's Equation, a fairly straightforward and popular equation where the variables are things like how often stars or Earth-like worlds form, for which we have fairly solid data and its other terms discussing the probability of life arising or getting smart or not killing itself off are great big question marks. We tend to naturally assume their values aren't going to be too different from the other ones we know. There are seven factors and even if they were all just 1%, our cutoff line from minor to major filters, and we know some are much more probable than that, but you'd still have around 10,000 galactic empires in our visible window of time and space. It would be freakishly improbable that none of those were close enough to us in space and time to be currently visible. For stacking filters, it doesn't take too much to lower the odds to next to nothing, and throughout this series we always emphasize that it's a cumulative process. So we are not trying to argue today that technology is so rare that less than one in a quintillion intelligent species ever develops it, just that after you've winnowed the worlds down to the relative few that make it to intelligence, It doesn't take much more to winnow it further on technology. Same as when we get to late filters next month, those filters which we still have not passed but that are needed to make you visible to us on modern Earth. We don't need to show that those add up to even a major filter, we don't know what the odds on most of these filters are, but if they combine to reduce it to less than one in a quintillion, then the Fermi Paradox is no paradox at all and I think we've more than justified that as a reasonable hypothesis in the previous episodes, and this recap has already gone on long enough so let's get to it. Once a species has cleared all those early filters and intelligence is in play, psychology becomes a critical factor in discussions of the Fermi Paradox, but speculating about alien psychology is a lot more of a crapshoot than discussing astronomical or even evolutionary processes that affect simpler life forms which is why we generally discuss psychological solutions to the Fermi Paradox in our somewhat tongue-in-cheek Alien Civilization series, where the need for a lot of guessing is the elephant in the room. But it is educated guessing. Just as an example, we tend to take as a given here that the most probable pathway to serious technology is civilization, via a species that is both social and curious. It's hardly a bad speculation either, you can't develop technology until you're smart, but brains are expensive to run and shouldn't just leap massively in complexity out of the blue. Such being the case, you start using technology when you're just barely smart enough, and thus you make a lot more progress a lot sooner and faster if you're social and can specialize, meaning Alex can specialize on crafting arrows while Bob can focus on crafting the bows that shoot them and Callie can specialize in crafting traps to keep the caves or huts free of vermin while Devon learns how to dig holes to dump disgusting garbage in to not attract them. Garbage, vermin, and disgust responses are going to be a major theme for later today too, as a heads up for any of you snacking during this episode, fair warning. By specializing, we can get more done when we're not too smart yet. But that's only handy if you're social critters, and so we can actually list that as a fairly decent filter. Early inventions are of less use and represent a far bigger investment of effort by each individual, if you don't all cooperate and in much more varied and vulnerable ways than simple cooperative hunting or even child rearing, where fundamentally everybody is fairly interchangeable or expendable and a pack doesn't need that many members. However, let me put a caveat on there. 
It is good reasoning but it assumes our style of brain. You could have the equivalent of neurons being woven into muscle fibers instead, muscle memory in a very literal sense, or into the bones, or some transmission mechanism that could rapidly speed up due to a minor mutation. Suddenly a species that had been early hominid smart all bounced north of Einstein on brain power, and maybe even so much that they don't need multiple generations and cooperation for major advancement, particularly if they are rather long lived, and we have no reason to assume lifespans under different biology would match up to our own. So you might have some race of long lived geniuses who are antisocial. This is not a great path to civilization and star-spanning ones at that, still it would be an example of a caveat where technology did not arise from a social species that was just smart enough to acquire technology through each member specializing. I think, as we contemplate that scenario, that it is also an example of an exception that proves the rule, since ultimately the Fermi Paradox isn't about if you can get smart or even get technology, but if you do something with it that lets us see you very far away. We use the galaxy spanning civilization as our main example because we could see them very, very far away just by their impact on their environment as they started engaging in stellar engineering and those other things we associate with such civilizations. See the Kardashev Scale episode, or really around a third of the episodes on this channel, for more details on why such civilizations ought to be nearly impossible not to see. Regardless, when discussing filters for the Fermi Paradox, it's all a probabilities game and so we're interested in what is most probable, not some unlikely scenario that might explain one anomalous civilization out of thousands. In that context, your most probable pathway would seem to be more or less the one we went down. Brains are expensive and need to offer a benefit. Part of that benefit for us is its use for social purposes, which makes it viable for us to share work and be more productive at it via specialization. Related to this is Dunbar's number, the cognitive limit of the number of individuals one can maintain a stable social relationship with, usually listed as about 150 for humans, which may also influence specialization. One can imagine this as a filter, since species with a lower Dunbar number might have a very hard time specializing much, while conversely, one with a higher one might have a real problem developing a culture able to function while exceeding that, because it wasn't so necessary even fairly early on. This socialization and specialization presumably leads to stationary villages after the rise of agriculture over hunting and gathering and eventually to the rise of cities. Long before we had what we think of as nations, we had city-states where thousands of folks could congregate for specialized tasks, which they used to trade or raid their less urbanized and specialized neighbors for food, and the city is both the root of the world and start of what we consider civilization. We already discussed in Rare Intelligence how important that transition to agriculture was for increasing your population density, and various ways that might fail to emerge. Indeed some theories suggest it took so long, not because we didn't really understand the concept, but because we had to wait till those plants slowly adapted to be more edible through a long process of us selectively gathering them until they mutated to be more optimized for us as a food source. Your basic diet can easily be considered at least a lesser filter, since only a more omnivorous scavenger type is really well positioned to pursue that option, and indeed our own setup as a persistence predator, capable of sweating to cool ourselves and jogging all day long when needed, something fairly unique to humans, is probably a pretty big factor in how we can get away with fueling and cooling our gigantic brains. Probably wasn't a predator thing originally either, We might easily have combined our great vision and endurance to let us spot circling vultures or similar and go charging off to scavenge that prey. We are very opportunistic in our style compared to other apex predators, we tended to scare our prey to death or run them to exhaustion and poke them then. We certainly did not, in the early days, have a dozen of us run up close and stab healthy and fresh mammoths out of the blue with spears, they'd have mopped the floor with us. I mention this though mostly because our increasingly rational brains didn't just pop out of nowhere and decide to start making tools. Our brains are survival focused, and part of that is for socialization, an important part of surviving in a pack, 
Another big part of that is danger sense, which we'll return to in a bit, and another is abstraction, which makes complex speech and invention possible. Probably not our big brain's original main survival purpose though. To avoid getting killed, you need to know something is a good course of action, and you can do that by observation or instinct, but you can also do that by running simulations. It's a lot cheaper to imagine what might happen if you run up to a mammoth than to observe other tribe members doing that and getting pasted, let alone waiting generations and generations for that to evolve into a specific instinct. We run scenarios through our heads over and over and over again, imagining how it might play out, indeed we can get pretty neurotic about doing that, but that is a massive survival advantage, and it's also the sort of thing that can lead to someone thinking, hey, if my arm was longer, I wouldn't need to be so close to that mammoth to stab it. Right now, even when we go after an injured one that can't move, we've gotta poke it where it can't react fast enough or at all. If I stuck my knife on the end of a fake arm, like a tree branch, then at worst it will just break my fake arm when it swings its tusks around. And those obviously are some examples of when a big expensive brain that takes years to grow can turn out to be a valuable investment. I should also note that while we often look with horror or disdain at our ancestors' habit of sacrificing animals, valuable things, or even people, that we might think of that as an early attempt at investment and bargaining in trade. Big concept there. Unlike most animals, who at most are just instinctively wired to set food aside for later like a squirrel, humans think on the future a lot, and are willing to suffer in the present to reap a bigger reward down the road. They were just as smart as us back then, though way less educated and scientific as it were, we are a lot more practical in our present day sacrifices to future rewards, but it's probably the same concept on display. Our minds can envision many possible futures, and our memories let us replay the past and ruminate on alternatives, and we can realize that a little sacrifice today can pay off dividends down the road. That's not as obvious a thing as you might think, as the Stanford Marshmallow Experiments on delayed gratification half a century back showed. Little kids have a very hard time waiting even brief periods to eat a piece of candy if told they will get even more candy if they don't eat it and wait and that's just with kids old enough to clearly understand. Think about something like agriculture where you need to actually understand that you must put food in the ground, or not kill it and eat it now, and wait months before you get more, then actually bring yourself to wait those months, and with the knowledge that it will require oversight, maintenance, protection, and luck to get that final yield. To us this is natural, and we get better at it as we age. Indeed delayed gratification is practically synonymous with what we mean by maturity, but that's a big and non-obvious step, and one many critters, even smart ones, might never make. And remember, that's just agriculture, one of the simplest and most fundamental of our technological steps, and delayed gratification is a cornerstone of a technological civilization. Even if they have a capacity for it, It needs to be a large capacity and one that makes it profitable in their setup, and which they believe in, often it won't be. Creativity is not nearly as valuable to an individual as we tend to think it is these days in a society that runs on it, because only a very tiny portion of creations, even useful ones, ever get used enough to support the creator. In a smaller society, even a clearly useful invention or idea represents such a large investment to dream up and make that it often might only get invented because you literally have a parasite class that can sit around on their butts being non-productive and just one in a thousand of them make something useful enough to have justified their daydreaming. Ironically, a society that doesn't tolerate such useless layabouts, which is entirely probable to pop up, might bash their heads in for being lazy. But speaking of parasites, I mentioned that humans evolved a pretty impressive danger and disgust mechanism to avoid dying. Do not eat something that looks or smells off. Do not step in something. Do not let a stranger nearby who might have hostile intent or be carrying a disease. Do not underestimate how powerful that impulse is even in a rational mind. The saliva in your mouth is obviously not dangerous to you. But if I hand you a clean cup and tell you to spit in it, then drink that cup, 
While that is entirely safe, most folks won't do it, even after the reminder about how safe it is. That thing was ejected from a human body and it is not meant to go back in. They'll get violently nauseous about it. Indeed just writing about it makes me a bit ill, and you can try thinking about it and seeing how you feel about doing it, even reminded in advance that it is not even a little dangerous, using that big brain capable of running simulations of actions. Now we only know that's safe because we know science. A pre-technological society does not, and is likely to be terrified about any possible source of contamination even if they know that sometimes it's beneficial to risk it. A good reminder of what the expression, I have a strong stomach, is generally implying. I don't know when or why humans started thinking of fire as a means of purification, but that's not a super obvious connection, and it's not hard to imagine a species might be terrified of fire, many are, and have a disgust feeling associated to it also. Such being the case, even if you could bring yourself to use it for warmth and light, there is no way you're going to eat food that was in one so you never invent cooking. Indeed you might not be willing to use anything forged in a flame either, or at least not feel comfortable using it for storing food in, like pottery. Or you might be especially disgusted by reusing anything that previously had food on it, because dangerous rot sets in in that world far faster, and scavengers are a much rarer and speedy lot. Maybe a very plentiful fruit turns poisonous as soon as germination begins to discourage any animal eating it once it's started growing, and will kill off any rival plants competing for that growing space. Hardly an improbable adaptation for a plant to have, and hardly an improbable mutation for animals to get, to avoid eating from any object or surface we associate to having food on it some time back, could really mess with your willingness to store food or reuse storage vessels. Our early cave paintings and art, and later our writing, mostly were done with inks that were food based, and a culture with a big fear of leftover food in any format might be very unwilling to use such things to decorate their homes or persons. If they are afraid to use ink and skins to write stuff down, they've got a problem. And for that matter a species with very good memories, bordering on the eidetic, or very good at crunching numbers in their heads might never get into writing stuff down or inventing the abacus or tally sticks, and that might actually hinder them on further development, for the same reason a critter with sharp claws might never invent stone knives. Same, they might be horrified at using bones for tools, and while we call it the Stone Age, bones played as big a role in our tools, and you wouldn't be sewing any clothing with a rock needle, nor are you likely to be wearing around the skins of dead animals if that horrified you especially if on your world they rotted or decayed faster, or were just less suitable for clothing, as many hides are, and it might be a bit of a coincidence that our preferred prey animals happen to have handy and easily preserved hides. If we weren't big game hunters but just scavengers or vermin catchers, we might not have gone that path. So too, we use animal corpses a lot in early food and water storage, we probably got yogurt invented by carrying milk around in some animal bladders, and sausage is an ancient method of food storage that's not terribly pleasant to think on. Desperation and necessity are mothers to invention, but often disgust drives can override even that, and if you're wondering why I'm focusing on that, we need to come up with a reason that would prevent smart critters able to invent technology from ever doing so even on timelines of millions of years. An ingrained disgust instinct toward some critical foundation technology or the situations that can spawn it are handy for such a barrier. Fear or disgust of fire is obviously a great one, since as we discussed in our looks at underwater species in ocean planets or uplifting, there really is no decently plausible path to technology without fire. Technology is a stats game, same as the rest of the Fermi Paradox filters, so anything that makes you less willing to use a piece of technology or less likely to be in a situation that will prompt thinking it up, can be enough to make it a decent filter. On the flip side, a species with lower disgust sensitivity might get itself wiped out by plagues a lot whenever they started congregating in large enough numbers to support technology. Storing your food also attracts vermin, a big enough problem I actually put our pets, often involved in vermin control, as one of our lesser filters last episode. For that matter, while an antisocial civilization has a big hurdle to developing technology, so would one that was a little too friendly and open, 
new things are dangerous. They really are. We're just about as desensitized to that as any humans have ever been, so we sometimes forget that. There's a reason why some wandering stranger by themselves is by themselves and looking for you. Maybe they got kicked out of their tribe for good cause, and you would be unwise to offer them a home. Maybe their tribe got very sick and they fled, carrying a disease. A species with very good immune systems, or where viruses or other pathogens never really got the same foothold, might lack that fear, easily congregate together, then suddenly hit critical mass for that to be a problem and develop a terror of ever putting thousands of people in a tight area. So they just never develop much and have little interest in technologies that let more folks survive. These are all examples of how a small species, quite capable of developing technology, might hesitate to do so and keep hesitating indefinitely, and that's important to the notion of inevitable technology. Many of us, myself included in spite of this, tend to feel that once they hit a certain critical mass of seeing technology as useful, that will keep going, and that since nothing is really putting a time limit on them, even if they hesitate to advance once, twice, or a hundred times, they will eventually make that next step. After all, we invented fire over a million years ago. We didn't use it for all that much until pottery and metalworking popped up around 10,000 years ago. Our whole civilization, historically, fits into only 1% of that fire-using timeline, and our modern brain has basically been around for about 10 times longer than our civilization has been too. So maybe that is an example of us just going at it till eventually the dam broke, and since it did we have enjoyed almost constant, steady, technological progress. Most so-called Dark Ages are more myth than truth, and resulted in very little loss of knowledge and indeed many of them also had technological gains not only globally far from the fallen civilization but actually in the alleged collapsed area. I wouldn't go so far as to say that science specifically was the cause, but more its conceptual forerunner, thinking things through a lot and questioning fundamental assumptions, arguably offsets of delayed gratification themselves. You've really got to be willing to pick through an idea to start challenging any sort of instinctive distaste and that eventually leads to gathering and documenting evidence and then creating falsifiable experiments to test hypotheses. But once you do, that would seem so clearly beneficial that you're going to keep at it, even if you have some false starts and setbacks, unless it leads you to a catastrophe like getting wiped out by artificial intelligence or such, which we'll say for the Late Filters episode. So while I feel we could make a decent case that many intelligent critters do make it up to basic tool use and invention potential or even capability but never proceed beyond that, being smart but primitive, and thus it might be a decent filter, I'm very dubious about extending that to where you are already at the city building and writing stuff down point. As I said, we really have not had that many genuine collapses, and those mostly local and less severe than often popularly claimed. Many of those are also thought to have had environmental causes, and such things don't make good for me paradox filters. One could argue that they might have a strong aversion to something like the steam engine, maybe on a world where geysers were more common and deadly, but that would not seem something where we could expect it to be more common than not. Or they might have a very extreme case of uncanny valley, a fear of machines or mannequins that seem very close to their likeness, but not quite right so they won't even contemplate computers or automation that even vaguely apes their thinking or function, though that might be so extreme they lower their neighbors to a degree of xenophobia unrivaled by even some of our most vile historical examples. Heck, that might be triggered by something like a sense of familiar smell or visual marker that is hereditary and makes them uncomfortable around anyone not closely enough related to share the full marker. Or they might be very disgusted by other animals, okay with eating them but not in keeping them as livestock or pets or working animals, or even employing their corpses to make tools or clothing from. But again, possible but nothing really pushing that to be a common, let alone likely case. We can potentially have even lower hurdles than our 50-50 lesser filters that could stack up, least filters perhaps. A lot of things where 90% or 99% of the time they get passed by but there were just so many of them that they added up, and indeed there are doubtless all plenty of those too. Wipeouts by asteroids or planetary collisions and ejections for instance, less likely than not to happen, but many such improbable filters might do the job enough 
to make the already improbable just a little too improbable for us to see another civilization yet. But I'm not seeing any of those along our own path from the nominal dawn of history from a few thousand years ago onward. Rate of progress might be slowed, but never seems to stop or reverse except locally and temporarily and that means nothing on astronomical timelines. Plus, once you get very into reason, you do start having the capacity to dissect impulses like discussed, and work to overcome it by exposure, or dilution, or modification, when you have solid proof it is both safe and useful. So it does seem like on balance that once you get the capacity for abstract thinking and reasoning, you're going to be on your way forward to technology, except where you've got a strong compulsion to avoid a keystone technology, and while my gut says that such aversions are probably no more common than would offer a lesser or maybe minor filter, we really just don't know. There are a ton of little things that had we not had or gone a slightly different direction we might have ended our path to technology, but not too many of them seem decisive roadblocks where another path might not have gotten there too. In a way, this filter after intelligence, if it exists, seems less about technology itself and more about developing the ability to contemplate hypothetical future outcomes and willingness to engage in delayed gratification or short-term suffering or risk to get a desired result. I do happen to think that capacity is a decent filter though, but fundamentally, much like our assumptions that the evolution of a basic brain will tend to lead to ever more sophisticated ones, there's a lot of guesswork and possible bias in those assumptions. We got there so it can't be too weird, but we know at least something we think is likely can't be that likely or the great filter solution to the Fermi Paradox wouldn't work. Assuming it is the right solution for the Fermi Paradox, and that those bigger filters all lie behind us, not ahead. But we'll save that for next month in Late Filters. Of course the alternative perspective to rare technology is inevitable technology. That technology will develop, quick or slow but almost always, if you have a species with a complex and abstract brain. And I felt like that notion needed looked at, and at the same time, our poll runner-up for our last YouTube poll was the suggested topic, could technology develop without fire? So I decided to do a companion episode looking at that other extreme, and I just released that over on Nebula to discuss if technology might still develop even on worlds where that most basic technology, fire, is denied to them. If you'd like to catch that video on Nebula or our other recent exclusive, Me, Myself and I, Cloning and Duplicants, you can get full access to Nebula for free when you sign up for Curiosity Stream. So in addition to being able to see their thousands of top-notch documentaries and non-fiction titles, you can now also catch all of the Nebula exclusive content I and other education focused channels have been making if you sign up for a year subscription of Curiosity Stream. A year of Curiosity Stream is just $19.99, and it gets you access to thousands of documentaries, as well as a complimentary access to Nebula for as long as you're a subscriber, and use the link in this episode's description, curiositystream.com slash IsaacArthur. We started Nebula up as a way for education-focused independent creators to try out new content that might not work too well on YouTube, where algorithms might not be too kind to some topics or demonetize certain ones entirely, and I'm very glad we're partnering up with CuriosityStream as we get ready to invite in more creators and bring more content to Nebula. So now in addition to all of CuriosityStream's great educational content, you'll be able to see videos from independent creators like CGP Grey, Minute Physics, Wendover, and of course, myself. Just remember to use the link in the video description when signing up. As I mentioned, that topic, Could Technology Develop Without Fire, was the runner-up in our last poll, and we do have another one up this week for you to vote in over on our community tab, and it will be open a few more days if you haven't already voted in it, and we often do one or more of the runners-up too. The polls we run for episodes here on YouTube's community tab usually get sourced from our Facebook group, Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, where the polling method lets folks add their own suggestions, and we take the top five and put them here to get voted on. I'm generally trying to do one of those every month or two so if you'd like to suggest future topics the next time we do a poll, or just enjoy discussing our show's topics with other folks, you can join that group, it's linked in the video description along with all of our other social media. 
Next week we'll be looking at some of the challenges with security on social media and the modern internet in Cyber Security. While that will be one of our more near-term and practical episodes, we will also look at some of the problems we might expect to develop further ahead in the future. The week after that we'll be back into the far future to look at spaceship design, from interplanetary ship considerations to intergalactic vessels moving at ultra-relativistic speeds. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.